baseball and trains a lot of baseball players. And then some of his ideas with, about how to train people with using different techniques to protect the shoulder, not doing, not concentrating on just velocity, 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 and doing some stuff. And some of the ideas of how he understood how the body worked and the kinematic sequence and how you could train that was kind of intriguing to me. And I really wanted him to get in to talk to the group today because we need to have more of, we have our clinicians that work with the patients we have our physical therapists and our surgeons, and they don't see enough of the healthy athletes. We need to know how the healthy athletes are as well. I mean, as clinicians, you see the numerator, you need to know what the denominator is doing. So we need to get the people. So that's why Nick is here today. That's why Coach Alvaro is going to speak in the afternoon. That's why he's easier, because these guys see the supposedly healthy athletes, and we want to know what they're doing with them so that they can guide us and we can guide them. Uh, I'll make this a long introduction because at the AOSSM this summer, Tom Brady sat down for an hour in front of the AOSSM membership and he spoke, he answered any questions that were asked. Uh, Jim Gray interviewed him in front of the audience, but he took uh, questions from the audience. And all he said was, and I don't like complimenting Patriot players, but all he said was, as long as nobody videos or record this, I'll say whatever you want me to say, I'll answer any questions. But one of the take home messages I took from him was, he said in professional sports, we used to work in silos. The coach wouldn't talk to the doctor. The doctor wouldn't talk to the strength and conditioning coach. The strength and conditioning coach wouldn't talk to the athletic trainer. The athletic trainer didn't talk to the coach. Everybody worked in their own silo. He said that changed in the last 10 years. And especially with the Patriots, but you know, in other teams possibly, that everybody works together, everybody works as a one unit where everything is overseen, what is done, being done medically, what's being done training-wise, what's being done on the field of play, who plays, who doesn't play, how many plays they go in for, who gets rested. And that's, where, that's what we're trying to do today, is get everyone's input into how we manage our athletes, in particular in this instance, baseball players. So, thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay, uh, first off, thank you very much for that inter uh, introduction. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, arm care from the strength and conditioning specialist, but I really think the best lens I can probably provide today is that uh, what I'll really be talking about is how we cloak uh, arm care into our increasing velocity uh, programs. Uh, keep in mind, I'm a business, so I have to sell, right? I can't exactly get a thousand athletes to come in my building from September to March on the uh, guys that I'm gonna keep you really healthy. Uh, they're not really interested in that right away. What they wanna know is how you gonna make me better over that span of time, and they're presuming that I'm gonna keep them healthy at the same time. Uh, I'll take a moment just to introduce myself real quick here. My name is Dr. Nicholas Sirio. Uh, I am the co-owner of Athletes Warehouse. We are a youth strength and conditioning facility, really a student athlete strength and conditioning facility. Um, we specialize in the student athlete, so that's really anywhere from uh, middle school up through collegiate level. We have some professional level athletes, but they've probably been with us uh, since they were either a high school age athlete. Uh, I am the pitching coach at Fox Lane High School. I've been there for the last 10 years, um, and I was a former collegiate baseball player at uh, SUNY Burke. So, uh, although my wife is not here, I feel like somehow she would know if I didn't mention how much of an indebted husband I am. Uh, on that point, I'm also a proud father, uh, Luke John, and then that is my daughter, Charlie. My background, I have a doctorate of performance psychology, a master's in exercise science. My master's had a big emphasis in performance psychology, which is what led me to go and get my doctorate. Um, and then my bachelor's is in exercise science. 
Uh, certifications, they're all listed there. They're the normal ones you would see uh, from any strength coach. So, um, as I was really thinking about this presentation and about what I was gonna talk about after Mal had asked me to come talk, first two, I thought it was 15 minutes, then he told me half an hour, so I got really nervous. Um, but as that was going on, I was trying to reflect back on all the other talks that I had been to and whether I had spoken at them or whether I was a uh, just a consumer of the talk and just listening. And a lot of them were all based on injuries, right? Injuries in baseball and how we are so aware of these injuries, how we have so much data on these injuries, yet the problem was they were all continuing to still rise at the same time. So I'm sitting there and saying, okay, I gotta bring something to the table in this talk. I have to discuss why, uh, you know, potentially provide a solution as to why this is still going on or, or at least drum up another question for people. So I was writing the script, scribbling it down, crumpling up papers and not really satisfied with anything I was coming up with. Uh, and in walks my five-year-old son. And he asked me and he was like, hey dad, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm trying to talk on a topic I really don't understand, which is research. And I'm not really sure where to start. And his immediate reply was, oh, hey, I know what research is. And I said, oh yeah, like off the cuff. Like he was really gonna know at five years old. And he said, well, it's, it's an investigation. And I said, okay, yeah, it is, buddy. And, he, and I said, what are you investigating? And he said, well, you, you try and ask questions so that you can solve problems. And I sat back and I was caught off guard because I was like, this is crazy inquisitive for a five-year-old. And first of all, too, I also thought, there's no way my overpriced preschool is where he got this from. So <laughs> I, I had to ask, where did you get this from? And you know, of course, shocked me again. And he said, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. They solve a investigation every episode. So it was, it was this interesting moment that happened, right? Where he made something that should be so complex seem so simple. And what really hit home to me was, there's a problem to be solved, right? And what are we missing in that problem? Now, obviously we're all here and uh, you know, we're all talking about injuries in terms of that. And we're resting assured that that is the problem we're facing in baseball right now. These injuries are occurring at a rapid rate. Um, so when he sparked that, I immediately turned to the computer and I went to do a PubMed search. And I wanted to figure out like, okay, if I typed in two key words, baseball and injuries, how many articles are gonna come up? And it was like 1800 plus. I said, okay, well, let me change the keyword. So I kept baseball and I changed it to throwing velocity. And it was only 300. So then I changed it to baseball and increasing throwing velocity. And we dropped to as low as 81. So it, it was starting to, to mess with me a little bit because I was like, well, wait a minute, like that might be the problem. The problem might be that we're solving the wrong problem for our population. And what I mean by that is this. So whenever you're like too close to the whiteboard or you're, you're just stuck in a problem and you can't see it from another direction, you gotta try and put a different lens on. So what I tried to do was look at it from a behavioral standpoint. Um, as I said, my doctorate's in performance psychology, which really just means you're, you're decent at understanding behavior, okay? And especially how it relates to sport. Um, but what I mean by that is I started to look at it from a perspective of the behavior standpoint in what are we trying to solve? Look, with research, what's the primary goal? The primary goal is to ensure that we're creating knowledge, right? And that we're spreading that knowledge out to our communities to eventually create behavioral change. But that behavioral change is predicated on really three different layers. And I think we're missing how we're going at it. And that's really what I'm talking about. It's not that we're solving the wrong problem. The injury problem is the right problem. It's how we're getting that message out there. Our population that we really want to get this to, and, and keep in mind, remember, I'm talking about a student athlete. So I'm not talking about the professional level as much. The professional level will listen, right? Because they have a lot of money invested in these guys. But these younger levels, when you're talking about a high school baseball coach, I'm at best a mild consumer of research as a high school baseball coach. As a parent, I'm negligible, and as a kid, forget it. That's not even on my radar. So most of my consumption of information is gonna come from my Instagram feed and how I'm going to interpret that. So let's get back to this behavioral topic here at hand. So when we look at trying to change behavior, there's really three layers this happens at. 
So it happens at our outcomes, it happens at our processes, and it happens at our identity. So when we're looking at this, and, and to understand that in simplistic terms, I'm gonna get away from baseball real quick, and I'm gonna to go to really what sort of our, our populations probably have tried to change behavior on, on numerous occasions, which is weight loss, right? So when we look at weight loss, and we look at just outcome results, what might that look like? Well, I wake up every day and I weigh myself hoping that that result will change. That probably doesn't work out, right? So that's what happens when we just attack our results end of a behavioral change. So then we, when we look to the process end of it, right, and we come down there and we say, okay, you know what? I'm gonna add in a different uh, routine that I do by going to the gym regularly and changing that gym routine. Okay, so how long does that last for most people? Who's ever tried that in here? It probably lasts about 10 days and you find excuses why that probably didn't, didn't continue or you couldn't continue it, so on and so forth. But then what happens, and if you've ever heard about people talk about, oh, hey, it takes 21 days or it takes X, Y, and Z to create a new habit or so on and so forth. Really what they're just saying is it takes that long for you to internalize your identity differently. And what do I mean by that? See, if you really want to create that change, what that person has to do is they have to start viewing themselves as a healthy individual, as opposed to the individual who needed to go to the gym, who needed to lose weight. They have to start viewing themselves as, hey, wait a minute, I am healthy. I am on that track. I'm going to make decisions differently because I am a healthy individual. So all of a sudden their identity starts changing drastically and they get true change and they adopt this routine and then they get the results they're really looking for. So let's relate it back to baseball. And here in this one, this is outcome-based change, right? This is pretty much what we're going after at the current moment. We're producing all this knowledge on these injuries, right? And suggesting certain process changes along the way, but we're not really attending to the identity of people we want to consume. And what do I mean by that? What is the identity of a pitcher? Anybody know? I can tell you flat out, I know exactly what the identity of a pitcher is. They want to throw hard. And whether they throw hard now, they probably want to throw harder. And how do you know that? Ask any high school age pitcher how hard they throw, I guarantee you they lie by two to three miles an hour. Why do they do that? Because it's prideful. It's prideful to them that they throw that hard. But think about how entrenched that is in their identity. They're willing to compromise their moral compass and lie just to protect their identity to say that they're a hard thrower. On top of that, they view it as a survival tactic, just like we view money in our society, right? Nobody's gonna go out and drastically change the way they make money today, just because they're like, ah, you know what, I'm gonna give this something else a different shot. No way. You got bills to pay, you got a family to keep, you got all these things that money is required to keep the life you wanna keep. Well, guess what? Throwing hard to them is as good as money. You wanna make a team, throw hard. You wanna get recruited, you better throw harder. You wanna play in the pros, you better throw the hardest. Because we know, as do coaches know, as that VLO goes up, miles per, uh, batting averages go down. And that's clear as day, we're watching it go on. And who are they watching? They're watching the major leagues. It used to be the times when Mariano Rivera would come in and throw 98, and the Twins coach would say, hey, this guy should play in a different league. That's not even fair. Now we got 106s popping up on the screen. So how do we attend to this identity-based problem, right? How do we attend to the fact that they are viewing velocity as their identity and the need for velocity as their identity? Um, again, I'm not saying that uh, throwing the hardest is the outright goal that we should have for every one of these kids, but the idea is that we need to determine a way to cloak our arm care and our injury prevention in the same system that is increasing velocity. Because if we don't, we're gonna to continue to lose to things like driveline when they're claiming these huge gains in velocity, which I get it, maybe those can, can happen, but never stating the injuries that are potential behind it. Think about how many college programs they work with. Think about how many high school programs they work with. Whose identity are they going after also? They're going after the coaches. Because the coach knows the harder my guys throw, the better shot we got at getting people out. But the problem is we're not attaining to the fact that we need to couple our arm care or our injury prevention within that. So uh, 
now that I'm done with my spiel on that, I'm gonna put my strength coach hat back on and I'm gonna give you our summary of why we feel you must earn the right to throw hard. So before you even get to that increase in velocity point, we gotta get you in a stable position and we have to get you to understand what that actually looks like. <laughs> so we follow three uh, basic principles that uh, underline not only our evaluation process, but also our programming process, um, and basically how we're gonna progress any athlete through our system. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we have the progression of specificity, uh, which basically means I'm gonna look at an individual as a human first, okay? If they can't perform basic human functions, I have no business caring about what sport they play. That's irrelevant to me. They have to be able to perform these basic human functions, and we'll go over what we view those as. Whether we're right or wrong, it's how we've started to progress. Uh, then, once they can prove that they can do that, we'll progress them to an athlete, to sport, and then we'll specialize it even further by getting into position. Um, coupled right with that is our progression of demand. So when we look at demand, uh, we look at it from these four different paradigms. Uh, so we start out with position. Uh, if an individual cannot get into a specific position, we're not gonna require them to perform a movement through that position. It just doesn't make any sense to us, right? They have to prove that they are capable of getting in the position first without pain. Next, we're gonna move on to movement. So they have to be able to perform this movement accurately and effectively. From there, we're then going to tax them. Our first real prescription of load is going to be the speed at which they perform that movement. Can they eccentrically load the movement? Can they concentrically burst out of the movement? Can they minimize the amortization phase between the two in that movement? All of these are hyper important to us in deciding can this individual progress to the next section of our program. Uh, and finally, you have load. Load is generally not prescribed in our evaluation process, uh, but it, keep in mind too, what I wanna explain here is load is not always in the object form like you're thinking. It's not just a barbell, kettlebell, uh, dumbbell. It's also from you know, are we taking this athlete and putting them with gravity, against gravity? Are we raising their feet, taking their arms up? We can, we can create load in a, in a multitude of ways, stable to unstable, so on and so forth. Um, and then the final uh, real uh, paradigm that we follow is, uh, really should be titled individual, uh, individualization is, is a necessity. Um, but really what we're talking about, and it's a way that I can give the cue as to why it is, I can't tell you how many times we get a kid that comes in and says, hey man, I play for X team and I got recruited by Y college already and I throw like mid to upper 80s to low 90s, I got this. I really just need you guys to get me along the way. Great. So I'm excited because I can't wait to work with this canvas. The problem is, is then when he goes through the eval, he flops like crazy. We can't even get him to the athlete stage because basic human functions he's really struggling with. Now think about this, you're talking about a guy who supposedly can throw in the upper 80s to low 90s, so he can produce crazy force, but he can't absorb any of it. He can't, he can't stabilize his system at any point in time. He's at the highest risk in my building. He's at more of a risk than the eight, eight year old that's downstairs Olympic weightlifting, who's going to compete at nationals, because that kid has been progressed accurately through the whole time. So, why this needs to be individualized, if I just paid attention to what they can do on a field, and if I took everybody for, this guy was pitcher of the year last year, I can just, you know, I can throw him into our highest level of our progression. No way, it has to be individualized along the way. So um, now I'm gonna take you through what our evaluation process actually looks like, uh, just so that I can give a glimpse as to uh, where we get our reasoning for putting corrective exercises in. Again, too, we, we view arm care as a holistic approach, as everybody has mentioned up here. Arm care is a squat, so we all understand. If my hips are weak, my shoulder is weak. The lat attaches to both, and you're not gonna be in a good place if you got weak hips and this strong shoulder rotator cuff. So what we need to do is look at it from a holistic approach and understand that if a person has an issue at the ankle, at the knee, at the hip, that's going to show itself in their throwing mechanics. 
So we start off with a basic uh, biometric history of the individual. And as Mal had mentioned, we do wanna know, uh, especially if we get an individual around the 15 to 16 year mark, um, and potentially even a little younger, we wanna know when that growth spurt actually happened. Uh, we wanna know if they've had it yet. Uh, and we do wanna know what the height, weight of the parents and sometimes even the grandparents are so that we can try and predict where they're at in terms of peak height velocity. Um, from there, we'll move on to a very basic sport, injury, and health history, uh, and then move to a joint uh, arthrokinematics and postural analysis test. It sounds very complicated, that happens very quick, that whole process. But really what we're trying to do is we're trying to clear the neck and shoulder. Um, and once we felt comfortable that we've cleared the neck and shoulder, we'll allow them to move on in our eval to our next four foundational movements, which we view as push, pull, crawl, and carry. Um, and really that's gonna comp uh, comprise a lot of our upper body sort of foundational movements right there. Uh, from there, at that same time in that posture analysis and, and joint other kinetics, we'll be looking at the lumbopelvic hip complex. So once we've cleared that lumbopelvic hip complex, we'll move on to the squat and hinge. If they can perform, like we talked about before in that paradigm, position, movement, speed, in the squat and hinge, we'll progress in that eval to the lunge, jump, and single leg hinge. Once that has been gone through that exact same paradigm, we'll move on to a single leg jump. We'll progress back to the upper body and start to look at anti-rotation. Um, listen, uh, he, he wasn't joking, we do see upwards of a thousand athletes a week uh, in the middle of the winter. Again, a lot of those are training on a team, understand that, so they're not all in a, and we don't do a ton of one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, most of it is done in small group scenarios. Um, but with that said, we've seen a ton of spondy issues with most of our baseball athletes right now. Uh, it, it seems to be this like quiet epidemic that is just rising in the baseball community right now. So what we've really started to look at is can these guys just not absorb the amount of volume they are trying to do with this rotation? Uh, when you talk to kids and you're like, hey man, how much are you swinging? And it's, well, you know, I take three buckets a night every night, and you're talking about 150 swings a night from a kid who, keep in mind, that same kid when we put him through an eval can't even progress past the squat and hinge because we can't perform those at different speeds, at different movement patterns, and we're now asking this individual to rotate at high velocities for 150 times a night, every single night, and wondering why we're getting hurt. So the engine rotation has been a big component for us. We've then moved on to a rotation component. Uh, once they can prove that they can rotate and single leg jump, we'll progress to our sprint end of that eval. <laughs> um, so we, we have in baseball this one-size-fits-all dichotomy. And again, I'm gonna put my lens of being a pitching coach on here and say, there's a reason there's a dichotomy there. Uh, the dichotomy is there because of the fact that uh, you have 20 to 30 kids and one to two coaches, especially at the high school level. And that's a tough thing to really handle every single time and ensure that everything is being totally individualized. So as Mal was pointing out earlier, it is really why our network and creating that network is so crucial uh, to the true development of these athletes so that you can have an individual that can take the time to individualize these throwing programs or individualize these shoulder care programs for each person. Um, I have the deadlift series up there. As you can see, most of the guys are doing varying different deadlifts. Uh, and the purpose behind that is when we talk about having a unified um, arm care, unified warm-up routine, it would be like asking every one of these guys to pick up 315 pounds the exact same way every single time they walk in the building and assume that that load is going to respond the exact same way to each person. It's just not. We need to rely on better coaching and we need to rely on the professionals that are put in those positions to express their expertise. Um, I was brought back to a point that Eric Cressy made, who in our field is literally considered the godfather of the shoulder because of how much knowledge he has in that particular area. And he brought up a case study from 2016 where he talks about the fact that a two degree um, uh, difference in positioning of the scapula can exude upwards of a 6% difference in um, muscular activation. 
during certain shoulder movements. So just think about that, like two to three degrees differential. And then what's so frustrating is when you start to see these kids go out with a generalized band program before a game and they're just ripping through it with zero and 10 and they're swinging their arm around all weird thinking that they're getting their arm hot and you're looking at them and they blow their arm out in the fifth game that they pitched that year and they're wondering why man i do all my arm care every time i come out because the small window in that room for error when we're talking about the shoulder is so precise and it's why this these programs and these programs like that need to be so individualized. So uh, I don't want to sit up here and just point out problems that we've done, right? I want to try and attempt to be a problem solver. It's definitely why uh, Mal wants me up here, which is to talk about the med ball series that we do. Um, the med ball series that we have at our facility is how we cloak arm care in um, and into our promise of increasing velocity. <coughs> So uh, key points to our med ball program. Uh, the medicine ball program we have is six different phases uh, in it. Most important phases are phase one and phase two. Uh, the biggest probably takeaway from the fact that we do this med ball program is we have four months of no throwing a baseball for our athletes. So right there, plain and simple, that's probably more arm care than 90% of the high school age athletes are doing which is stop doing the action that we know is going to eventually cause injury for at least four months time and allow yourself to refresh, regain strength and get back stronger. Um, on top of that and how we've gotten to that point, we are uh, basically trying to obliterate fall baseball. Um, there's zero point to it. It is at a time when the athlete is totally tired, they're taxed, they're playing just one game on a weekend, they're not taking anything serious. Uh, they're not getting recruited right then, so it's pointless. Um, and it's really just a moneymaker for a lot of these club organizations. So we've been really trying to eradicate that scenario for a lot of our players so that they can experience this four month off window. Um, some other key components. That med ball that you see in a kid's hand is one pound. Um, there's only one company that I've found that actually makes it that size. Um, I, and unfortunately, I don't even know it, so, uh, but I, I will send it to something. Um, but it's one pound and it's done with two arms overhead. Um, we perform the movement with two arms overhead because we've found that there's less impinging uh, scenarios in that opposite side arm, that glove side arm, when they come actually overhead. And it also allows them to get chest back forward um, when they're going to make the actual throw. So I'm gonna bring you through phase one of the med ball series real quick. And he's gonna be flipping through and I'm hoping that that video will start to run a little smoother, maybe it won't. Um, but essentially there is 10 different movements here uh, in, this, in this phase. The primary reason for phase one is not to improve any velocity, is not to improve any mechanics of pitching, it's not to get anything other than teaching the individual how to throw a med ball. And it's a skill that they must learn. And what we have to watch very closely for is that they don't alter their normal throwing mechanics too much while trying to throw this med ball. That's the primary goal of this phase. If you notice, their back foot is pointed forward. It's pointed forward for a reason. It's taking away that issue of having to decide when to transfer that internal rotation in. Because that coiling effect and that internal rotation wrap to the top side is what creates most of that velocity. We're not interested in velocity here. We will never take the radar gun out and velo any of the phase ones because we are not looking for this individual to try and throw the ball through the wall at this point. Um, the progression from 1.1 to 1.10 is the only one that has 10 phases, the rest all have eight. Uh, the progression is uh, speed demand, so our load is actually speed. The ball is constant, right? The ball doesn't change from the one pound, so the load becomes speed. So basically, one is starting from a knee and moving slow, whereas 10 is a basically like a running gun, where they're running straight forward and then throwing the med ball. So it's least amount of speed demand to most. Um, phase one, unfortunately, may take a very long time if your athlete is not very athletic. Um, because it is a very cumbersome, coordinated movement, uh, it may take a long time for you to accurately progress them. I am going to blow through these, and as you can see, the video is not going to cooperate as well. So, but they are on our YouTube channel, every single one of them uh, in cyclical order or individualized as well. Phase two, uh, 
hands down the most important element of this phase, uh, of this entire progression, my favorite section. Um, it's the one that looks the most like pitching mechanics. Uh, it, is the, it is the one that has the best transfer rate for us. And we've done the most research, that's a very loose term, um, we've done the most data collection with uh, 2.2, which is basically if you could envision a pitcher pitching from a um, stride position and they're in a, uh, what's it called? They're going to take a short step with it. So it's a short stride, not a full stride with the action. So what we have found with these miles per hour is this, is that low to mid 30s, uh, and we take this with a pocket radar, um, low to mid 30s equals about low 70s to mid 70s in terms of throwing velocity uh, with a baseball. Upper 30s to low 40s is going to equal uh, upper 70s to low 80s. And then mid 40s to upper 40s is going to equal mid 80s to potentially touching 90s. Anybody who has crested over 50 miles an hour has already thrown in the 90 mile an hour zone. Um, cool stuff that we've done with this and why you can take the miles per hour is a lot of times we've had individuals who throw a med ball slower than they throw a pitch, right? Which is actually how it starts out normally. So what we do is we continuously work on their throwing mechanics with that med ball. Now, why would we do that? That seems pointless, right? They don't throw a med ball in a game. But what we've actually seen is that as we progress the miles per hour or the velocity of the med ball, it'll catch up to the actual throwing velocity and then both will start to slowly but surely increase over time. Uh, we've had it the other way, where an individual has thrown a med ball faster on our scale, basically, than they should be throwing a baseball. And what we've done at that point then is taken the mechanics of them throwing a med ball and compared it to the mechanics of them throwing a baseball on a mound and tried to find out where we saw the differential between the two. One thing that I can say about these med ball drills is the intent behind them that you start to see is different than you'll see with a baseball. With a baseball, there's a lot of fear behind it from a young kid that if I'm throwing all out every pitch, I'm going to create an injury in my arm. I completely agree. And I feel that fear. I've had that fear. I was a guy who didn't throw something hard, so guess what? I had to throw hard every single pitch, and my hand did go numb every single time. So those aren't great feelings if you've felt that before. But the difference is with the med ball, they can give this unbelievable intent every single time they throw it without any fear of discomfort or injury. And it's been amazing to watch. And how do they know that intent? Well, sometimes, yes, we're taking velocity of it. Others, the sound that it makes off the wall is so encouraging to a kid when that ball absolutely slams the wall and they know they just threw that ball hard. What's even better is when they first start out, it sounds like a dud when it hits the wall and then all of a sudden they hear that smack later on as they progress through it, they start to know internally, this thing's working. So there are, as I said, four other phases. Um, and again, this is just gonna breeze through one drill of each of those phases. So phase three starts with band resistance. And again, remember I said earlier, it's not a linear, it doesn't always have to be a linear progression. So we can bounce around. They have to go one to two. After two, we make the call where they're having the biggest deficit. So we use three with a resistance because that is for our guys that we feel are not exuding enough force off their backside, or there's not enough internal rotation force that they're exuding throughout their mechanics. We'll use phase four, which is band assistance, meaning it's pulling them faster, because in this instance, we want to teach an athlete a couple things. Number one, you can move faster. Number two, you can absorb more intent than, you're actually, than you actually think you're capable of absorbing. So it's causing them to overload that Golgi body tendon system and causing their body to shut down some of that and allow them to absorb more eccentric force on that front side. Uh, number five is a drill that we use with our, also with our throwing mechanics, which is up the mound. We have created these little like uh, half mounds that we have in there that you can see him throwing on. And we'll actually have an individual when they don't have a stiff front side, meaning like so they're losing kinematic sequencing by the front knee continuing to leap forward after it hits the ground, after that foot hits the ground. 
or they're not extending, triple extending for that front side, um, what we'll do is we'll have them throw up a mound so that eccentric loading comes earlier and is less uh, to them, and then we slowly bring them back down the mound to teach them they can do this on flat or vice versa. Um, and then finally, number six is basically combining uh, four and five. So it's when we want maximal eccentric overload to happen for this individual on their front side. Uh, that's my son, Luke. Um, anecdotal experiences and takeaways. Um, so again, this is not research. Uh, as Mal put it, we loosely collect data all the time. We are a business first and a data collection a very distant second. Um, because of the fact that we've been doing this now for three years, I can give you some of these statements with superior confidence in that uh, we have had substantial success with athletes increasing velocity uh, by doing this program without throwing a baseball for four months. We've had guys go from, no joke, 61, where I had to ask him if he was actually throwing a baseball hard, as hard as he could, to 88 miles an hour. Now granted, that took a two and a half year period of time. That's not, and, and I'm also not sitting here saying growth didn't help me in that equation. Um, the other part is we have never once had an individual decrease velocity uh, or lose the gains that they have made by coming into that program. Uh, and probably most important, nobody has ever gotten hurt performing the med ball drills. Limitations, as we are aware of this, we are never just using med ball. So the med ball is always combined with strength and conditioning. It is also always combined with uh, sprint and plyometric techniques. And we are never claiming that the med ball is solely the reason for their velocity increases over the time they spend with us. Keep in mind, we're usually trying to get an individual to spend at a minimum of four months with us to a max of six months with us during these phases that we're running them through. Um, so listen, that's what I have today. I hope if anything, I cause you to ask a different question, like my son put, to solve a different problem, and we can hopefully get it out there under a different lens to really start making a change. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, any questions? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the driveline program. Are you familiar with it for uh, any research on and early incidents that you follow if you want to go through that or else you can like have a the I mean there there is a couple of research articles out. Are you talking on that today? Okay, so you're gonna get that info in just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Very nice talk. Question I have here. When you use the, the, uh, the ball, you, you kind of force in both hands in the overhead position. Sure. Some of these throws are naturally three quarters of throws. Do you see injuries develop because of the, the force action you're getting at? I, I should have mentioned that. So we do have some sidearm throwers, and we do not require them to go overhead. Um, so in that instance, they will come off kilter this way and they will throw from that side. Um, one of the indicators that we look at when we're watching the drills, uh, if somebody is not getting back to front side, okay, or that they're over rotating, so they're trying to create this sort of false separation back hip, back shoulder, is the ball will come out spinning very weird. Any of the guys who you see throwing the ball at super high velocities, the med ball comes out in almost a knuckling pattern or a straight spin over a state like this. Our sidearm guys, we allow the sideways spin to happen because naturally they're going to be coming to that. Good, uh, good job, Nick. Uh, question. One pound med ball, you ever use it sounds eight ounce, nine ounce ball, like, the, like some of the programs that are out there? Do you dabble even put it in and <laughs> training sessions? Like it's not February, March season beginning, do you work on? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. After you guys always one pound ball? So we're, we're always one pound with the overhead right. stuff like that. Um, however, I should note that some of our pro guys and our um, even our higher end college guys who have sort of like peaked on the med ball, we haven't seen much change, we'll bring them up to actually a two pound and you will see the numbers go up a little bit, but we feel very comfortable with how strong they are. Uh, I should note too, I'm not bashing something like driveline. I'm, I'm just 
pointing out something that's very obvious and they actually do a phenomenal job on Instagram and everything like that to attract those people. That was the reason I was using that message. Um, but we do use a lot of the recovery patterns um, with those under ounce and over ounce balls uh, from eccentric throws and things of that nature. Yeah. I really like how you put the exams on like push ball and like how you look at everything for the strength. I'm just curious how does your process clear the neck and the shoulder and clear from the pelvic hip complex? Do you have a system that you guys use? Yeah, so for everything that we have, we build a progression of exercises or a progression of uh, the tests that we've done. It, again, uh, I think the biggest key when you're talking about any of those progressions is to allow flexibility. Um, so each individual, like each evaluation is very individualized in that sense too. Um, but for that point, yeah, there is about 16 different um, movements that we'll have for each one of those. It is an extreme rarity that somebody will perform each 16 of them in the actual exercise or in the actual eval because what we'll generally do is start out with the easiest and if they blew through that, we'll progress them all the way down to like number eight. If they failed eight, we might move back up to four and try and find out where we're at. What it does is gives us a really good indication of, hey, where do we start on our program progression? Um, and where we start to get very individualized with everything when you're taking it then to a program progression is, okay, just because you were at this on a push, what else is affected because you're at that on a push or because you're at that on a hinge, right? Like, can I, uh, if, if an individual got up on a pull-up bar, which eventually, you know, we're seeing as our max on a pull phase, right? If you can do a vertical pull with load, you, you, I mean, your pull series is phenomenal, right? But can we really progress them to a bent over row if they have a horrible hinge? So it, it starts to really balance against each other each time, and, it's, and it, then it goes to, listen, we have phenomenal coaches, so I don't want to take their expertise out of it, right? So we, we provide this progression, we provide these principles, and then allow them to transfer that into what they do best. I hope that answered that. And I have uh, one question that is, you use a one pound ball, but you might have people of varying different sizes. You might have younger kids that are light, older uh, kids that are heavy. You don't adjust it for their size. So uh, to be honest, actually, when we first started, we started out with a one for our youngest guys, and we had a two for some of our older guys, and a four for like our college guys. And we started to see that um, when we started taking metrics on velocity, our older guys weren't even matching the velocity of some of our middle range guys. So we said, okay, that ball is probably too heavy. And we worked our way back. Um, what we have found, if anybody's ever held a one pound ball too, it's, and, and it's dispersed like that, is super light. Um, and we haven't found any issues working with younger guys. Uh, the youngest age we will start the med ball program at is the modified level um, with that. And, then, and obviously, again, they don't start the med ball series unless they've cleared through that evaluation process. So if they have some kind of issue uh, at the shoulder joint or at the elbow joint or at the back joint or at the hip, uh, they're not going to go into their med ball series. One final question before lunch for not for you, Carl Arashimo, our biomechanist. Can we measure the forces in all the joints that they do those exercises on our force plates? So that we could figure out what the loads are on the shoulder and, and then we could also have them pitch without the mind to a proper pitch and compare the loads in a proper high velocity pitch versus that. You should probably do that. And um, on that, we are about 20 seconds off 12 o'clock, so it's lunchtime. We'll meet back at 1 o'clock. The speakers, if you meet up here, will go to uh, the hot room for lunch and snack.